Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wrestling with Rosenberg. My guest today, the world's strongest man, Mark Henry. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, uh. what's up, buddy? I'm doing good, man. What's up? This is the long, the the vaunted appearance by Mark Henry. How long have we been playing this? Uh, we've been well, we've been buddies for about oh, going on three years, I think, something yeah. like that. Time flies. Man, when you're having fun, getting your ass kicked. So, um, let's start with right now. Uh, how did you feel about the match with John on uh, last Sunday night, the pay-per-view? I thought it was a good match. Uh, it was a real good match. You know, like as far as uh, pay-per-views go, uh, you would be hard-pressed to find a pay-per-view outside of WrestleMania that was that action-packed, that anticipated, um, and lived up to the billing. Uh, do, there are people. I here's my. I loved the match. I thought it was great all the way through. Uh, I didn't love for the fact that I, I didn't win. Well, that part hurt. I am biased when it comes to Mark, but also I and some other people didn't love the finish. Didn't love you tapping to John. There was something that I don't know. I would have been happier if you had taken two AAs than tap. Did you have any? misgivings about that or were you fine with how everything played out man i was fine with it man um for one john is um arguably um the best wwe champion ever was and and that's saying a lot because you had an undertaker and Shawn michaels and not a lot not, not, not a lot of people have the longevity that he has had as the main event guy. And people going to try to knock him down until he quits. And um, if he can do it to Undertaker, if he could do it to Big Show, if he could do it to Triple H and Shawn Michaels, and that's pretty good company. So if I'm going to get my ass whooped, it might as well be by the guy that has whooped everybody. Do you feel that John gets a tough time from people who criticize his um his in-ring ability and things like that? Yeah, a lot because you know, like he's not he's he's unorthodox. You know, I mean he's he's a good athlete, he's not a great athlete. Um he's tough, but he's um kind of got that crunchy granola, you know, just real blatant uh, white meets baby face thing, and people hate it. People just don't want, they want to see somebody with an edge, somebody that's got a couple of drug charges, and somebody to hell somebody up. You know, they want to see a guy that, you know, could punch you in the face in the street or something. He, you know, he ain't that guy. So there's there's going to be argument. Um. All right. I want to end up going back a lot to old stuff, so let's finish up a couple other things about right now. Um. First of all, what changed in you because a lot of people respected your work over the years, but clearly the level to which people took you as a serious player and a real great, I think a lot of people would say that in the last few years is when you really cemented yourself as a Hall of Famer. What what happened? Was there, was there a switch that turned on in the last few years that just made it easier for you? I wanted my legacy to be concrete. Because I, um, seven years ago, uh, a little over seven years ago, um, they came to me and said, "Hey, um, you know, you did you did a good job in your career," and it was kind of talking like you know it was over, you know, and um, um, my contract had two more years in it at the time. And they like we we need to renegotiate. We 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 don't look at you as being like a main event talent. You know, we wanted to kind of phase you to more of a mid card, more on a on a uh, in between on the average side of it. I'm like, man, just taken aback. You know, I ain't used to nobody considering me average. I ain't never been average in nothing. I rather uh, change businesses and try to do something that I'm really good in and be happy than to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the talk I got. I, and um, I thought about quitting, but I, I'm not a quitter either. So, you know, I, I wanted to see it out. And I basically I took a 50% pay cut. 
pay cut to a mid card uh salary and um it just you know to to go back and look in the mirror and have somebody um consider you a, a failure it it does something to your soul you know a lot of it was hate and anger you know like i wanted to prove and i had a reason to prove it and that's that's pretty much what it was i just you know um looked at what I was doing and decided, okay, if this is not good enough, then maybe I'm being too nice. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dummying down too much. Um, you know, it, it just lit a fire in me. Now, can you, or can you tell the story that you told me off the air once about how the pre Hall of Pain Mark Henry character began? Is that a story you could tell? Not not without <clears throat> I can I can give the Cliff Notes version okay. and the uh the clean like uh, a lot of people say, you know, I'm 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 pretty evenly killed, dude. I don't walk the streets enforcing the way that I feel on the inside. I'm gonna tell you how I feel on the inside. See like when I look in the mirror, there ain't a human walking this planet. That if they step in my face, UFC, MMA, Navy SEAL, anybody that I'm a back down from, I I put it right in their face. I don't care. I pull your skin from the top all the way down. That's the way I feel. I didn't use that in wrestling because of my fear of the perception. I didn't want to reinforce a negative stereotype. They expect that out of me. That's the way I looked at it. When I say they, I mean America, the public media, the you know, and so forth. So I didn't want to portray that. And um, <laughs> it's funny, come to find out, you know, it's like that's exactly what a wrestling fan wanted. And it took for them to piss me off and say that I was average for that to come out. And uh, there's a few people that I don't talk to no more because they look at it as that's me for real. And it is me for real, but I'm trying my best to keep that happy medium, not to walk through the locker room and go, get the hell out of my way. You know, you see me walking, you know, and there's people that'll try you like that. And currently? We, currently. They, I mean, there was times where uh, a lot of them are phased out. You know, it's it's pretty solid now, but there's still a few assholes. And, you know, like you would be walking and people would be in your path or they just stand in the middle of the walkway and you're just like, you know, and, and before I wouldn't have said nothing to them, but these last five years it's been like you're gonna just stand your ass in the walkway i don't care if you're in the main event or not like i'm different visibly different and different on the inside because i feel like it's my responsibility being a veteran in the business to keep shit in check um are there? Uh, do you have any good relationships um, and kind of mentoring like relationships with any of the younger guys in the company? If so, who? Um, Sandow is one of mine. Um, uh, Cesaro is one of mine. Uh, as much as he's not a rookie, um, uh, Kofi Kingston and our truth. Um, Daniel Bryan is one of mine. I picked him from the beginning. And I said, that dude going to be somebody. And, you know, Vince, in a way, has the has this, I can't really get behind a little guy, but he'll give you a shot. And he shouldn't have gave Daniel Bryan a shot because he is true with his shot. He put it right in your heart. Everybody loved him. I, I always thought, for me, and I still think this, that in my ideal world, of course, again, I am biased as a friend of Mark's, but... I wanted you to take the title off Cena, and just like there was an opportunity for it two years ago, I wanted Brian to take the strap off at you. 
I, I think that would be the most you meaningful remember thing. Remember the matches that me and Daniel Bryan yeah, had. Yeah, right before the it was right before you went out, right before you hit the shelf, right when you guys started going. Yeah, and you had the title. Me and Daniel Bryan killed it every night. I, I just loved the idea of I thought it could have built up that year if you hadn't gotten hurt. If you if he had chased you to WrestleMania and at Mania he finally had made you tap. I just thought that would have made him forever. And see, like why why is it that it's sacrilege for John Cena to make me tap and it's okay for Because Daniel. I love that Brian's so small. I and, and to be honest, no disrespect to John, I think that I just don't like John's finish. Like, I just don't think it looks painful. I think Brian's finisher actually looks like it can it make is. it tap. Exactly. <laughs> they, they both hurt. You know, you see my knee. My knee was pulled up a lot farther than it's used to going. You guys did have, I, I loved the, the false finish on the attitude adjustment, though. I thought that was really cool. Um, but I just, I, I always thought that the little guy taking the title off of you would mean even more. I think for Daniel Bryan, and I'm not a big fan of face-face stuff. So I think, you know, especially you being Evil Hall of Pain, Mark Henry, I think Daniel Bryan getting it off of you would, I just think it would be a bigger pop. But, you know, that's my, you know, my personal. Yeah, well, you know, you start booking your promotion. Yeah, you know, Rosenberg Wrestling, when we start, I'm going to start. Um, who, is anyone else you're a big, a big fan of, of the, of the new guys? You know what, man? Um, I, I I go back to Cesaro. Um, he is freaky, freaky strong for his size, and and I'm not just you know the strength thing is make, but it, it's just like he has a a level of seriousness that I think has not been completely tapped yet. Yeah, I mean he he's somebody that can be a major player. He just got to. Keep living. That's all People have been talking about it. They keep saying he's like the strongest. A lot of talk of him being the strongest. Guy in wrestling. Yeah, so I... He, he's strong. Freaky strong. He, could he get you up? I think he can get me up. Really? He picked up Big Show. Damn. Yeah, he, that's true. I mean, if he picked up Show, he could pick me up. I'm, what do you think about um about CM Punk? Uh, Punk is not a young guy. And Punk is somebody that I respect a lot. Um, he deserves every amount of accolade that he gets. Um, he's passionate, brilliant on the mic, articulate, smart, and has a, a sense of humor and is not afraid to laugh at himself. But the thing about Punk, more than anything, is when Punk looks in the mirror, he sees me. I was going to say, do you? he seems like another guy, a get-the-fuck-out-of-my-way kind of guy also. Punk? was 300 pounds and 6'6", six, six, he would be dead. Somebody would shoot him in the head. You tough dude. Little dude, tough dude, man. I would love to see you go with um, Ziggler sometime, too. I think that would be fun to see. And I don't want to have to, like, say too much, but I'm going to leave it at this. We've had two matches in both of them. Um, people that are high on my list of respect said, damn, that was good. That was good. Well, Both he, times. He flies. So, like, the two of you together could just look for a crazy the, – the aesthetics of it would be awesome. Man. Like, when that dude takes a bump, those back bumps out of the back of the ring. He, he's a he's a poor man, Shawn Michaels. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, they, they see something, but they don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's Shawn Michaels-esque. That's well, a good guy to be a poor man's version of. I would take it. I'd take it. Um, all right, so let's go back. When when you first decided to go after your illustrious lifting career and Olympic career and uh, and being lit legitimately the world's strongest man, did you know from before that that you wanted to go to wrestling? No. So what happened? I was I was a wrestling fan forever. My grandmother took me to see. Ernie Ladd and um, um, Andre the Giant and uh, Bob Orton and people that went to Beaumont Civic Center. Um, we would go to Houston to see Tiger Conway Jr. and people. You know what I mean? Was, I, I was a wrestling fan, and um, in 92 or 93, um, I did an interview where I said, 
I was a wrestling fan. What does what the world's strongest man do in his spare time? Um, I'm a video game head. You know, I like girls. And um, I watch wrestling. Don't bother me on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Because wrestling, you know, you had main event. Then you had, like, you know, the Saturday recap. And then you had Monday Monday night. And um, um, Vince called me at in Colorado at the Olympic Training Center. And um, I thought it was, like, one of my buddies that we watched wrestling with and hung up on him. <laughs> and my manager called me back and was like, you hang up on Vince McMahon? I was like, that was Vince for real? He was like, yeah, dummy, take his call. And what did Vince say? He was like, I heard you was a wrestling fan. I was like, yes, this is really Vince McMahon? Say something Vince McMahon would say. <laughs> you know, I was a fan, man. I couldn't believe it. He was like... Um, this was before he was Mr. McMahon. Yeah, this was before Mr. McMahon. This is when he was this still was just Vince McMahon commentator. Vince, yeah. And um, I didn't know he owned the company. That's how, you know, dumb I was. Um, he um, he said, you, you want to come to Stanford and, and see what we do? And I was like, yes. Hell yeah. Man, I got on a plane like two days later. Went to Connecticut and met everybody. Got to meet Yokozuna. Really? Yokozuna was at the office. And I ended up being Yoko's young boy. I ended up driving him down the highways and fetching stuff for him and being his gopher. You were that was the first guy you got attached to. Really? Yeah. What was Yoko like? Yoko was cool as hell, man. Tough, tough, tough. Him and him and him and Taker uh, were the same guy. Him and Undertaker, same same guy, identical, like twins, and they were together all the time. So I guess you know it was only fit. Um, so when you go see it, you check it out, did you know pretty, pretty early that this was what you wanted to do? You were like, I'm going to do this. I, at, when, when the, uh, when the Olympics was over in 90, 96, I had already been, uh, talking to Vince and, uh, about, you know, like, I don't know how to wrestle. And he was like, we're going to find somebody to train you. And he was like, uh, we've been debating on this whole developmental system thing. And um, I was the first one. I was the first guy in the, in the there were still territories. There's still some left, right? You know, there was, you still could go work Memphis. You could still go work Florida, uh, St. Louis. Um, California was still open. Texas still had like three promotions. Um but Vince started, you know, he went and bought Briscoe and him out in Florida. He went and got Jerry. Jerry came over and started commentating and wrestling. Um, I mean, actually, he was re Jerry was wrestling still. He wasn't. Um, he he wasn't. No, he, no, he was. Yeah, he was doing both. He was doing both. He was doing both, and he ended up becoming your first match, right? Right. He ended up meeting him and Jake Roberts, and like I mean, like people don't. I mean, I've been around a long time. Well, that's the thing. Not only do you forget that you've been around a long time, but you I also forget how long I've been around. And then you forget how long some of those guys lasted, and like that Jake still had. You know, Jake still was the match that set off Austin. I mean, Jake lasted for a long time coming back. So, where did you end up doing most of your training? I started in Stanford with Tom Pritchard. And at that point, uh, I was still a young guy, easily distracted by women, easily distracted by partying. I wasn't putting in the work to get it done. Uh, and that was, that was on me. Um, it took me probably three years to start getting it. And right out the gate, I broke my ankle. I mean- What were you doing? Uh, just running the ropes, the mat was loose, foot got caught, <laughs> broke it. And how long from when you first started training with Pritchard to what to your debut? Um, another year because I had to so, heal up. So you got on in like a year, but you don't think you you didn't start really learning the business for a few years. Yeah, it took about three, and uh, then I got in an argument with um. Guys, over you know I'm I'm not a, a pushover, 
you know, God, I broke my ankle. They hit my crutches. I threatened a couple of people, and I ended up exiled to Canada. And um, that's when I ran into Stu Hart and Brett and Owen. And so they sent you. So you you were having trouble getting along with people. I was having trouble getting along because you weren't taking the ribbing and shit. I, you can't rib me. I threatened to kill people. <laughs> My wrestling etiquette was zero. Was zero. So, <laughs> and and plus, when I look at you, I look at you as being a human. I wasn't. Don't 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 talk like you can whoop me. I beat the shit out you. Did That's you get in? I felt. Did you get into any fist fights early on? No, I mean, I, I just pushed. The, I think somebody got pushed in the face. I ain't gonna mention his name, but he ain't that special anyway. Um, but I was starting to get out of hand to the point to where um, it was main event people that couldn't rib me, couldn't talk to me crazy. I was like, you're 180 pounds. Like, get out of my face. But in retrospect, do you think that are you? Or do you think that was the right thing to do? No, it wasn't the right thing so to do. So you think you should have? If a young guy came in now and did that to me, he wouldn't be in the business no more. So if a kid came in now and wouldn't accept the ribs and turned around and was like, don't fucking rib me, I'm so-and-so, you would look at him like... I'd get his ass whooped first, but his if he was able to stick, I would make his life miserable. And I, everybody that I thought was an ally, and you either on my team or you're not on my team. You know, I... I don't want him here. I don't like him. I'm going to make it rough. So they say, they think that about you, and they say, well, we love this guy. He's talented. Right. And we got to get. get so had, they sent you to Calgary. I went to Calgary. <laughs> and uh, so what was that like? So then you get up to go see it Stu. Was, it was cold. It was <laughs> snowing. It was three feet of snow on the ground. I'm from Texas. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, man, it was rough. Man. Did you live in the house? Where'd I you live? No, I lived, in, I lived with. Um, uh, in a little apartment right next to Brett Hart, Brett's house, about like three miles from Brett's. And uh, with, he had a, a ring in his pool house. And um, Leo Burke, a famous the guy that taught Bad News Brown and uh, a bunch of people. You know what I mean? I can't sit here and name everybody, but it's, Bad News Brown was like one of my favorites. So, I mean, I was like. And he was huge in Stampede. Yes, he was. I mean, and then he was friends with Stu, and he was like, well, you go over to the dungeon and roll around on the mats and learn how to do some holes and stuff. And so I was learning wrestling and wrestling. So what was, uh, was that, first of all, was anyone else that we now know of in the dungeon with you at the same time? Uh, Andrew, uh, Tess. Oh, really? Was there, um... There was a guy named Ronnie Blackbeard. He was really good, but, you know, he's just too troubled. Glenn Coco was a famous football player up in the stamp, in um, the Canadian football. Couldn't cut it. Akamal Bright couldn't cut it. Um, I mean, it was just like it was – there were some guys that came and did, you know, little trials and didn't make it. How how rough was it was, uh, was Stu? Stu was uh, – at first, it started off as being funny to me because he would always try to come and grab me and put me in stuff. And all right, well, you got to know how this feels to know what it what it'll do to somebody. And I'm like, all right, Stu, and I just relax and let him. And he try to do stuff. And he's like, ah, you big son of a bitch! I can't put this. Ah, I just and you know he he was rough dude, and and he was one of those that was like you know it's the little tiniest things that hurt. You know, and he, you know, it was just like you couldn't believe that this little frail old guy could put his thumb underneath your nose, and he was like, wherever the nose goes, the head will follow. I, ah, you know, you like, ah. I mean, he just he was rough, man. Put his chin in your eye socket. I mean, just crack your orbit bone, anything. He 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 used to he used to torture Davies boy. I oh. mean, like. Who? Uh, it was children. Harry. Harry. and uh, So you knew Harry from when he was a little was a kid. Boy. Yeah. I'm talking about like seven, eight years old. You know, him and uh, Tyson Kidd and all of them. Like, boy, he used to torture them cats, man. Put their elbows together. 
Oh. Let me put your elbows No, together. I'm good. Let's see how that feels. I'm good. Wait, which way do your elbows go together? Man, like that way. That way? Yes. No, I don't want that at all. <laughs> I see what I'm saying. Like, so, wait, so, dude but, was rough. So, um, and did you did you get, uh, how long were you there for? He loved me. He, I mean, he, I used to remind him of this guy named Luther Lindsay that he used to carry a picture of him in his wallet. He said, it's the only guy that ever whooped me. I was like, you carry this bitch in your wallet? You know, he was like, he was my friend. Uh, and and were, you, were you close with Helen, too? She she cooked for me a little bit, you know. But she mainly was like, Mark, can you make sure those kids don't hurt the animals? <laughs> were the animals everywhere? Everywhere. I remember she, I stopped eating over there. Uh, <laughs> too many cats? They had like 20 cats, man. And it was a cat, you know, she was cooking eggs. And, like, I mean, when she cooked eggs, it was this big, giant pan. And uh, she was cooking eggs and, like, uh, a cat shit on the counter. <laughs> and she, like, took the spatula and was like, ah, oh, threw it in the garbage and then, like, washed the spatula. And, like, just kept back. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. No. So did they also teach you about the ribbing part of things, yeah. too? Because the hearts are notorious. Yeah. And and they said, man, this is part of the this is part of the affection of the business. Like, I mean, you can't, you know, laugh at yourself and play with each other. Like, you're gonna be around each other a lot. You don't have to learn to deal with that. I was like, yeah. now, did you actually do any matches in Stampede while you were there, or was it just training? Just training. So you never did you ever I go, watch? You would I, go to the shows. I would go to the shows. Yeah. Um, they had like Rick Titan and all those, you know, guys. That, and were you around all the other crazy hearts too, like Smith and and? Yes, I'm sure you. I'm gonna stop. And you can that. stop right there. Oh, uh, is this when you first got to be close with Owen? Yeah, me and Owen got real cool because, um, not only did I find Owen to be hilarious, but he was the one guy that was like. Man, look, I'm a, I'm a teach you. I'm a, I'm a just listen to me. He's like, I'm a joke with you, but I'm not gonna joke with you to the extent where it's gonna hurt you. He's like, L just listen to me. And he, he basically was the one that was is probably responsible for me staying in the business because at that time, I was like, when I go back to the states, I'm done. I was ready to quit. So even though you enjoyed your time there. You still didn't think you'd be able to adapt to doing because it. I, I just felt like I I still had the football bug and I was like, man, maybe I maybe I should have just went and back and played football. Was well, now was there was there a racial component to everything that made it harder too? There there was some of that still around. Uh I mean there's I I don't feel it now, you know, but I'm I'm not your normal, uh, normal guy. I'm a, I'm a miss some, some stuff. You know, it's like it's a trip how, um, people tell me all the time, like, man, you, you're a celebrity, so you know, people not gonna try you like they would try me. You know, and and I've seen it. And I realized that, that it's a reality to that. So to a certain extent, you're saying you don't even necessarily... I'm almost exempt from some stuff. From some of the racial stuff yeah. because A, people respect you and you're famous and you're huge and all those different things. Right. And it's, it's sad, but, you know, it's, um, it's a reality. It's a harsh reality, but it is a reality. Did Owen end up ever ribbing you? Yes, he did. But also, I was I started to... Do a little ribbon. We we played a joke on my mom. Uh, he called my mom and told her that she hadn't paid her taxes and that they were going to come and we were going to come and take her house <laughs> and take her car, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And um, my, I had never heard my mom cuss before. And he was like, um, ma'am, are you listening to me? You know, like talking to her kind of real stern. She was like, Yes, I can hear you. Like, don't talk to me like a child, you know. And I'm like <laughs> <laughs> laughing, you know, trying my best not to b just bust apart. Um, what what was uh what was that night like? The 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 night with Owen. How how rough was that night? It was rough. Were you on the card? Yeah, I was on the card. I had, um I I had already worked, and I was he was riding with me. I was driving. Oh, at that point, you guys were riding together. Yeah, we were riding together. 
that that is that a concept that still exists the same way? I want to get back to that night to the pay per view, but is that a concept that still exists in the same way in terms of the meaning of the the friendship and camaraderie that comes from riding together? Um, you ride together, you 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 very comfortable with each other because I mean, it's, how, that's, how many men do you know that you can? You don't want to listen to what they want to listen to on the radio, but you'll do it anyway because that's your boy. Uh, you know, everybody have they, uh, they things that annoy the hell out of you, and you just have to put up with it. It's like, uh, uh, man, like to be able to put up with everybody. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you don't, as an adult, there aren't that many people that you'll sit. A car is almost like your home or your bedroom. Right. I mean, and, like, so when you're sitting there right next to someone for hours on end, eating together, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you be you become like brothers, man. Almost like my as close to a brother as I've ever had outside of my family, because he just, you know, he taught me stuff too. You know, like I looked at him, you know, with, with reverence because he he helped educate me and mold me. Um, he taught me stuff that I needed to know. You know, I was a little bit arrogant. You know, he, he told me he's like, "Hey, I'm I'm just being honest with you." Like, you think really high of yourself. <laughs> He's like, you need to bring that down some. Now, but one thing, I does it get over, Owen's so beloved, but Owen was a heart. Did Owen also think and realize that he was pretty hot shit too and knew that he was a damn good wrestler? He knew that he was a good wrestler, but he was never, ever arrogant or uh, like, man, I'm, I'll kill that guy. I'm so much better than him. Why should he get? Owen wasn't that dude. Owen was like the guy that was like taught me how to be a team player. He was like, uh, I I was. He was like Brett was the favorite. My dad always favored Brett. You know, he was like Brett, but Brett was good. I I mean, look at him. You know, so you have to be able to say, okay, I'm good, but. That guy's good too. Respect the fact that he's good, and if if the boss' the decision was to make that guy the champion, then who are you to to go against it? Uh, was there legit heat between Owen and Austin? Uh, there's legitimate heat between everybody at some point. I don't. Uh, I can't say that one way or the other. If if, if there was, because I, he never showed it to me. He was always the one that was like, look, if you got a problem with somebody, don't make a big production out of it. He's like, go pull them aside and say, hey, if you got a problem with me, I'll be behind the bleachers in about five minutes. Low voice. Be calm. Let them understand that you are ready for this. And they'll leave you the hell alone, you know. And a lot, and I, I, I tried it out a couple of times. You know, there was a couple of people that I had to pull aside and say, hey, man, like I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the bad talk. Like, if you got a problem with me, I'll be over here. Um, to close out the Owen Hart chapter of this interview, um, was there a, was there another night that was as because the wrestling business unfortunately has been filled with a lot of rough nights. Was was there a night ever worse than that one? No. No. Not at all. And there, there have been other people that I, I respected that uh, unfortunately passed. Um, there's been some shocking, disturbing stuff that happened in wrestling. There's been some, some you know, stuff that you you just you know you couldn't hide from because the world knew about it, but nothing. Nothing like that. That was my that was my brother. Um. All right. So, at the same time that you come in, this is this is a pretty transitional time now for WWE. It's, it's going from the old friendly ways of the uh, late '80s into this weird mid '90s phase that it's in as we're getting into the Attitude Era. Um. And you come along, and how much after you did Kurt come along? Uh, Kurt came after. Um you got, do you guys know each other as Olympians, by the way? Yeah, yeah. We knew each other. We we lived in Colorado Springs at the training center. He would come in for camps and had a little brief stint living there. And you decided to come first to WWE, though? Yeah. 
and then some, somewhat in the next couple year, next year, two. It was probably like uh, two years. And um, what was? How long did it take you to sort of get acclimated? And what you had a, a few gimmicks there, of course. I mean, obviously. Um, sexual chocolate obviously resonated on some level considering people still chant it every night that you go out. Um, but what was the first thing that resonated for you that you actually enjoyed? Did you enjoy sexual chocolate? Do you enjoy Nation of Domination? I, I, enjoyed it. I enjoyed sexual chocolate as, as much as anything because during that time, um, I was learning a lot about myself as an adult. Uh, I, I've, you know, I, was, I was a kid, you know, and uh, a lot of immature stuff was going on. And, um, you know, during that time, I, I met Dwayne. And um, we lived together in in, uh, in Stanford and were training together. And um, it was uh, it was pretty cool, man. But um, I didn't like hanging around Dwayne because he used to tell me all the right stuff to do. And I ain't listen to him. I was like, "Look, man, I can't hang out with you, man. You bringing me down." <laughs> like, what, what? Just taking care of himself, making good yeah, decisions, just making good decisions, and you know, training wise and psychology wise, and like he was talking. I was like, "Man, well, yeah, let's go, let's go to New York, man. Let's go to the Palladium or something. <laughs> let's go find somewhere to kick it." You know, he was like, "Man, you need to go to sleep." We got a train in the morning, you know, and I was I just wasn't ready, and I didn't want to listen to all that, and um, that's just the ignorance and arrogance of youth, you know. So. But I guess the sexual chocolate, knowing you now and your personality, I guess the sexual chocolate, like many wrestling characters, did tap into a real part of your personality. It was an extension, if you will, <laughs> of me, and. You know, and they knew that about you. They knew it. Everybody knew. You know, like I love the ladies, man. It was, you know, it was pretty easy to uh, to play that role because you know I'm I might be ugly as you know the yeah. crack of dawn and, <laughs> and like Biggie say, black as an ashy, but I, I was still I got the women. Um. So, but and by the way, that must have when that's the character you play on TV. Do women then, even though it's like ha 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 funny, when you're out and about? I'm sure women still kind of play into that character. Like, oh, well, you're if, sexual if, chocolate. If, if I, yeah, if I, especially if I perpetuate it, right? You know, but now it's like, man, that's just dead. Man. My, <laughs> my wife and kids just killed all of that. The sexual chocolate's a wrap. <laughs> sexual chocolate is a wrap. Uh, I can't even play sexual chocolate at home. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like the uh, Nation of Domination? Loved it because you know Ron Simmons and D'Lo Brown. Um, uh, Godfather and Savio and I was around I was talking about this yesterday like I was around like five of the best workers ever ever and then Owen came into the nation <laughs> Owen came in, I know. it was the black heart yeah so good that's so good awesome and it was just like man my life is perfect now and that's when I started learning I mean like it was it was like uh, it was like master class. You ever see like these? You got these five guys. It's okay. Like we gotta take this away. We gotta take this away and put this in there. And put this in, and and it was just like I became me. Um, in a nation that was. And were you guys all run on, on the road together at that point? Yeah. So man, who's we, riding? Who's in the car at that point? You guys have two we, cars. We ran right? a van. We we ran a couple of vans sometimes. It'd be like me and Dwayne, or me and Rock and. D'Lo and Brian Christopher and Scotty Too Hotty, you know, like, because we were in Kane, you know, like, I mean, like, we we were all the young guys then, and now we're all the old guys. <laughs> um, Yeah, so that's, so who do you consider in your class? Who is in your age class that you consider, like, you? you... Now, um, uh, Kane. What year did Kane come in? Same, almost Kane same time. Kane came in like um, uh, four years, five years after me. Really, that much later? Yeah. No, no, he was there by the late nineties. 
And you were there ninety. Came you came in ninety six. Kane came in in, in um, ninety nine. Ninety nine two thousand. Oh, and you came in in ninety six. Ninety six. Ninety seven. I, I mean, I actually started training in ninety six. The beginning, I had a year off, and then ninety seven, ninety eight, or, or four years later. Okay. Um, and then show, I guess, is still a little bit before show, you. Show was um, show came afterwards too. He was with. Um, WCW. So he'd been around. So he basically is the same generation in WWF, but he'd already been working. Right. When he got there, he wasn't green. Right. Not quite right. Right. anymore. Um, so then from that part of your career, because it's almost like you could divide your career into two portions. In that first 10 year part of your career, what, what, do you, what was the best thing for you? What was the, your, your favorite, your favorite run? Um, I was really, I was really um, happy with being coming back in 2002 uh, after September 11th. After my mother died, I had been refocused, and then it was like I had been to Louisville. Um, you know that that was one of the things that we kind of skipped um, is. I went to Kentucky because they thought I still needed to be uh, more educated for the business. And um, you went to OVW, right? To get sharpen, you know, your skills, if you will. I mean, it's like, how do you sharpen a mountain? You know, that's my that was my mentality when I went there. You know, but um, you know, I got there and I realized how much I didn't know. You know, like um, Jimmy Cornette, love him or hate him, and he might be crazy as a shit house mouse, but I respect Jimmy Cornette to the fullest because he was the one that was like, "Do you know who Killer Kowalski was? Mm -mm. Do you know who um, Danny Hodge was? No. Then you don't know shit about wrestling." Like, you have to know this business in order to understand what it can be and what it is. And he was the guy that did that. Handed me book after book after book, The Hooker and uh, videos and um, little pamphlets on uh, Judo Jean LaBelle and this guy. And, and I, I learned wrestling. I learned the history of wrestling. You got to know where you've been and know where you're going. That was his philosophy. And um, there's outside of Vince McMahon, I don't think that there's nobody that has ever loved wrestling more than Jim Cornette. He, the, yeah, there ain't no. I'm, I'm serious. Vince and Jimmy Cornette fought, cussed each other out all the time because of their philosophies on what it is. But Vince wins because he owned the company. <laughs> you work for him. Just do what he say and just go on about your business. But Jimmy couldn't do that. Jimmy said, I just know better. You know, and he's like, oh, maybe not, you know. Who else was there when you went? So you go there to 2002. Danny Davis and Rip Rogers. Holy hell. Those are the guys working with you. Man, the Ripper. What did he, he teach you? Humility again, you know, and, and, um, and sharpness. You know, it's like, you got to be sharp. You got to be crisp. People going to see through you. Like, I don't care if you know how to do a headlock or not. Do it a thousand times. And then do it another thousand. You know, so, I mean, he was he was a a, a proponent. His, his, his idea of learning the business was repetition. Do it over and over and over and over and over and over. Um, and what new guys were there? Like, was Cena there at that point? Punk came there. Punk came there. Randy, Brock, Sheldon Benjamin. Um, there was uh, Slick Robbie Dix, who I thought would have been as good as anybody that I mentioned. Uh, Batista. Um, <clears throat> um, I know I'm leaving people out, but that... It was full. Yeah. I mean, that was... So you've known all those guys. You've known Punk since... They first, o day, they first day they started. 
Wow. I've seen him come in. He'll make it. He won't make it. He'll make it. Big Bad John, the, the you know, Heidenreichs, you know. the. I mean, there's been some guys that came in that didn't make it. There's been a lot of guys that came. You know, I mean, it was, man. How natural was Randy? Just like Rock. You know, their dads wrestled. It's, a, it's just. Their fathers wrestled. They, they knew how to wrestle already. They. From playing like my son, like he he'll know how to do it. Yes, it's just going to be very simply, very easy for them. Um, but you still have to go into it like you don't know what you're doing to respect the trainers and to just get the work. You know, it is what it is. What uh, is there anything about your size? that can make something that should be somewhat basic in wrestling much more difficult? That maybe for the guys you work with is much me, easier. Me putting holes on people look funny. I don't I don't put a lot of holes. I'll bear hug somebody. I'll neck crank people. Uh, I'll front face lock people, but that's about it. Why do you think it looks funny? It just looks like a, look like a monkey kind of trying to screw a coconut. <laughs> It just, just looks too small. Yeah, just like you, this big old guy trying to. Yeah, 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 Doesn't seem it right. Looks, it looks stupid. Uh, what's your favorite kind of match to have? If you have to pick a stipulation kind of match, cage. Why do you like the cage? Because people get tuned in to what you're gonna do to the. You don't you if the cage if a piece of sharp steel is right there, and I get your face, and I. I don't have to push you into it. I just have to have you near it. And people be like, oh, <laughs> get away from That's what the cage, the cage, man, it just it just pushes you on the edge of your seat because you, you know what could happen. What about that YouTube video that has like 2 million views of when you tr- you were supposed to open the cage and it wouldn't work? And people, you know what, man, I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people say, look at stupid Mark Henry, you know, Mark Henry F's up, uh, this, that. You know, man, it wasn't a, it wasn't a mistake. The The chain that we used um, um, for the business just didn't, you know, it didn't, it didn't go as easy as it should have. And realizing that it wasn't me. It was the who put the cage together that forgot to help it out a little bit. What do you do, do in it. that moment, I had to though? Do it when you realize, okay, this is a real chain and a real lock, and I have to be, I have to get in the cage, <laughs> and it wasn't no way around. I had to break it, and I broke it. Um. So it took. Uh, I think it took like eight minutes. Eight minutes to get in there. It took like eight minutes to get in there. It got cut out. A lot of that got cut out. Now, uh, one of the rumors that went around recently about why you had not re-signed your deal or why you ended up on the shelf was about injuries and you people saying outside of the office, the dirt sheets and whatnot, people questioning your uh, that they thought that the office was upset with you because they thought you weren't working hurt. Or that you know you didn't toughen up in that way the way it should be expected that a wrestler is supposed to. Well, that that wasn't the case. That's um, what was the case was uh, before WrestleMania I was hurt, and I worked like two months before WrestleMania beat up. I had um, the cartilage on the end of the rib, floating ribs. Um, separated and I did it (laughs) it's funny it's not really not funny but I came back like a month before elimination chamber from injury and went to elimination chamber and got hurt again I mean the first pay per view back I got hurt again which is supposed to be your gear up for Wrestlemania right and I'm just like, damn. Like, I'm old, so stuff is going to rattle and crack because I, I I wrestle with Reckless. And there's outside of Bam Bam Bigelow and One Man Gang and um, 
maybe Vader, nobody, no big guy ever worked like I work. And I, I'm saying that those were the big guy workers that were uh, people respect and that I studied them. And In terms of they were big, but they moved and bumped. Moved and bumped and athletically and over the top and threw and took everybody's finishes and could do anything. And do it on the floor, do it on the steel, do it in a cage, I, on concrete. I mean, we, I broke my kneecap in half and wrestled for five months with a broke kneecap, letting people step on it just to make it pop back into place. Like, nobody can ever question my toughness. Um, I, I mean, I am, some, I am concrete in the sense that I work with pain. Um, that that wasn't the issue. It was the fact that I I asked. I was like, after mania, I need to take some time off to heal up because I'm I'm half assing it, and I I don't I didn't want to do that to the fans. I didn't want to do it to myself, and I didn't want to do it to the company. Then I was like, well, I'll go on the European tour, two weeks, fourteen shows, and. Two days of travel. I go over to Europe, work 14 days in a row. Like, once you get excited, you're just going to go 100%, regardless of whether you hurt or not. You just got to go. And I went, and I went, and I went, and I came. I was like, look, I, after this tour is over, I need to have some time off. And I was getting more pissed because it was like, well, we, we, we need you. And, you know, like, do just you know like do this show and then you'll be able to get some rest, and I just felt like it never was going to happen, and then, um, then came out the whole like the leading up until the pay per view, um, uh, Extreme Rules. I um I worked through that another month. And then um, I'm pulling trucks, and it's, I mean, just. By the way, it's, 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 talk, you really were pulling trucks. Yeah. You really pulled both trucks. Yes. Was that something you expected to do? Had you ever done that before? No, I never done that before. And um, there was, um, um, I mean, we 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 work. the The show is is a uh, is a show. And we do what's necessary for the show. But physically, I was pulling the trucks. And um, my body was beat up. And then I kept going again. Then I went into Extreme Rules, and I could, without being too graphic, it was hard to wipe my own rear end. I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't sleep. I had to. I had a lot. Of, I had to sit in chairs. I couldn't lay down. I mean, it was crazy. That was. I was in a lot of pain. Up through extreme rules, man. Through extreme rules, and it, after after the show, I you know I just you know people was like, man, that was a good match. And I was like, man, it was nothing like I wanted it to be, and I limped out of there and. Um, I just I just went home. I told him I'm going home. I'm not listening, to y'all. You, and my I, my contract was, you know, was expiring. You know, I, I had expired, and I was just working injury days. You know, so um, you know, I ain't have to do that to myself. And um, I knew that my worth um meant something. And that's all I wanted acknowledgement that I was worth something because I had been told that I was average, that, you know, um, uh, I was, I took a 50% pay cut. It was a lot of stuff that went on. I was like, tell me where I am now. And, you know, basically we had that come to Jesus and, uh, so where are you right now? Uh, I, I I signed another a three year deal. You did sign a deal. Yeah. For three years. Yeah. 
So you will be around. I'm going to be around. We're going to see more of Mark Henry. You're going to see me. Even though we, many people thought you were retiring. Even the smart Marks all thought you were retiring. Well, I was. it was intentional. Well, do you know how good it was going to be? Do you have a hunch that you were going to have maybe the best night of the year? I mean, that was literally the, one I of the best. I didn't know if it was going to be the best night of the year, but I, I was finally going to get the cry and use you know my ability to to act well how much of it was real though too because you reference your family which you are so passionate about and also you know that at some point whether it's not for three years or not the end of the line is closer than it's ever been before yeah, were you able to years. I, i'm not signing no more so you're done you know you're done somewhat soon were you tapping into real feelings you know you will have I, I went to acting school. You know I went back. When I, <laughs> when I tore my knee up in 05, I didn't ever think I was going to be able to wrestle again. Dr. Andrews, uh, who did the surgery on RG3. And, Damn right. Um, I hate him. Uh, <laughs> he, he said, I'm a Redskins uh, fan. He's a Cowboys he said, fan. You, you're, he said, you you done. He's like, you know, we anchored your IT band through your uh, knee, and it's not really a – you know, it's really it's not really functional. Like it's just there. He was like, I I would not do any real light lateral type movements no more. And that was in '05. Wow. Well, hey, you're making me feel great about Dr. Andrews. Dr. Andrews is the truth. That's good to hear. Um, what in this last stretch of your career? I mean, what do you? What would you really love to do? What would you love to be known for? What would you love to have happen? I'm sure. I mean, I don't know. Did the, did was the idea of winning the championship last week? Would that have meant an incredible amount to you, or as fans, would yes. it, be, it would mean a lot? I mean, uh, uh, man, I, the reason that my people see me speak on the show and they say, "Man, I, I believe that," is because it's true. I'm not going to go out there and fake nothing. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell it like I see it. I've been told, Mark, you can go out there and say whatever you want to. You cannot make a mistake. Thank you. So you want that title before it's all said and done? I want it. I want it before it's all said and done. I, I really, honestly believe that it'll validate me as uh, being one of the top ten big men of all time, and I, I can handle top ten. Oh, absolutely. I mean. There's some some special key people in that category. Yeah. Um, do you think that I, this just popped in my head recently? I, I want to interview Vince one day and ask him about this. How important when you when people always talk about the the biggest names in the history of the WWF and WWE, they talk about uh, often the conversation is between Hogan and Austin as the two names that people most throw out there. Who are fourth and fifth on my list? Who are fourth and fifth on your list? Yeah. Well, then, before I get to the part I was going to ask, which is about the place of Andre the Giant in that conversation, number one. that's what I was going to say. Is it possible Andre's number one? Andre is number one. Ain't nobody can be number one other than Andre. Why? Why do you think Andre's number the number one superstar in the history of WWE? When I say that, here we are, 2013 going on 2014. Everybody on this planet, above maybe 12 years old, knows who Andre the Giant is. Whether you watch wrestling or not, he was an entity in this world that has never been seen since. He did for wrestling what nobody... There would be Andre the Giant on the card and nobody that you ever heard of. (laughs) All you needed is one guy. Austin, great. Couldn't do that. You had to have somebody else on that card. Undertaker, very close to Andre. He was able to sell out arenas. Gorgeous George, uh, Hogan, and your people. Who? Bruno San Martino. Why is that my people? Bruno, that's your guy. I know you was all misty-eyed. And- I wasn't misty-eyed for. I mean, I'm, I I didn't grow up. I grew up in the era after Bruno. So Bruno is just what I heard about. Like my grandfather used to watch when when he was an older guy. My grandfather used to watch Bruno San Martino. Okay, so it was your grandfather. I thought you said it was you. No, you? I mean I respect Bruno San Martino for God's sake. He's he was the early re- wrestler who got referenced in hip hop all the time. 
Yeah. I'm a great champ like Bruno San Martino because rappers are all from here and that's right, right, right. Wait, but here's my thing about Andre. The reason I think Andre is the greatest. First of all, there's the, the reason the comp- look, I, I, you you cut me off, man, because you got the power of the mic. Man. Go ahead. Can what? I finish, man. Sorry, I thought you were done. Jeez, you cut me off. I, you know, Andre did what Will Chamberlain did. Will Chamberlain and people say Michael Jordan is the best basketball player of all time. He is not for the simple fact that he did not change the game like Wilt changed the game. They changed the key. It used to be called the key because it looked like a skeleton key. They widened it because of Wilt because he could just stand there and rebound every shot that went came off the basket. They changed it. They took the dunk out of the game because of Wilt. Andre changed the game for wrestling. They the arenas started being from little small uh, places that held 3,000 people to places that held 10,000 and more. People started coming from other countries to see Andre in person. Nobody did that before. Andre, nobody. They didn't come to see Gorgeous George from Spain and Russia and Australia. But everyone wanted to get their eyes on him. Everybody had to see him with their own eyes. I The the reason the conversation started in my head a few weeks ago was I went to go uh, visit uh, Joey Styles in Sanford. And I went to go, when I went to, we, we just went and had lunch. And I met him in the lobby, my first time ever in, in the building. And when I walked into the WWE headquarters, the thing that I was most struck with is that the only things in the lobby are Andre the Giant. Right. There's Andre's hand thing, and there's a statue of Andre, and that's all that's there. And I thought they also have the cast that he, when he broke his leg mm -hmm. doing the six million dollar. You know he was Sasquatch in the Six Million Dollar Man. Yes, they have the cast when he jumped over the thing. He broke his leg, and they have his cast. They have the cast there. So that got me to start thinking about it, and then I thought about you know I know how much money he made and how many people he drew. But then you look at the next biggest guy who you would have the argument is number one is Hogan, and Hogan would never have truly become Hogan With if he hadn't God. slammed Andre. And that's the epitome. I mean, listen, you can look at a lot of heels, and Mark, great example, I call you the number one heel in the business right now, and you're killing it. But you ain't never had a moment, nor has anyone else, like when Andre was on that thing in WrestleMania 3 going back to the thing, and the, you just see the trash from the whole arena. This man who'd been beloved turned the entire world, world. into hating him. Yeah. I mean, he was a god. You know, and so I, I just, I'm interested, I would love to talk to Vince about that, about where he holds Vince, Andre. Vince, Vince will tell you the same thing. There's nobody above Andre. I mean, I would imagine to their family, Andre was everything. He changed man, everything. he, dog. Andre is the best of all time. And if anybody ever says otherwise, any, if Austin said he was better than Andre, if Hogan said he was better than Andre, if uh, Flair said he was better than Andre, uh, San Martino said, if any, I, I would look at them differently. I would look at them like. Did you ever get to meet Andre? No. Never, huh? Because. Well, I mean, when I was when I was ten, uh, I saw him at the Beaumont Civic Center, and and I you know I was one of those kids that run to the rail and got pushed over, and he grabbed me and put me on the other side of the fence. Really? Touch me. Must have been the best moment ever. Man, I'm, I tell people to this day, man, I I remember lying to somebody saying, yeah yeah he we friends, man, like he he picked me up and everything. <laughs> I remember that. Remember that lie. Well, isn't it amazing? <laughs> Remember that lie. The amazing thing about Andre is, too, is that unlike a lot of the great ones who you hear about, who a lot of them became good guys but weren't always good guys, Andre is just known. I mean, when everyone tells a story about Andre, what did he call everyone? Boss. Everyone knows Andre called everyone else boss. It was like his way of addressing other people, making everyone feel comfortable with him. Right. It's like he was truly this gentle giant. But you know what? I, I've heard stories of Andre like getting on a plane, and he would have two first class seats, and he thought, in which I think too, 
if where you sit above your head is where your stuff go. And Andre got on the plane, and it was stuff up there. He was like, what? And then he would grab it and just <laughs> throw it down the aisle <laughs> and put his stuff up there. I, I mean, like, there's stuff about Andre that I've, that I've heard, I would read every book that ever came out about him because it, it just interests the hell out of me. And I don't know if I buy everybody's books. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I was definitely put Hogan. And when you say money, you got to put Hogan and Austin in the top three because of money. But they will. Nobody is gonna go number one other than Andre. And so who? Eric, the battle for second to five, to second to ten, is is a good battle. And by the way, you said wait when you said you have Hogan and Austin. Hogan at four, Austin at five. Who do you have at two and three? Well, I mean, uh, he is he is the great one. I mean, I, I think that. Um, Rock has been able to do stuff outside our business to bring people into our business. And, um, you know, Undertaker um, is is in my top three because of the pageantry and the longevity and the WrestleMania. Uh, he... he, he People say Shawn Michaels is Mr. WrestleMania. Really, Taker is Mr. WrestleMania. Who, who's, be, who's better at WrestleMania? Well, if nothing else, he's main evented the last six or whatever. The true main event the last five, six years has always been Taker's match. I rest my case. Um, hey, this has been a pleasure. We're going to do this again because you're going to be around for three years, which we learned uh, today, which is very exciting for the wrestling world because you are doing the best. You are I told just, you I have some news for you. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one. That's a headline right there. Um, but you are biased, unbiased. Everyone knows you are doing some of the best work in the world right now. Um, interesting to that. see what this next chapter presents because the last time, because it looked like, I'm not going to say anything, it looks like the direction you're going is a little bit different for your, where your character has been recently. And I hope it's done. It's interesting because the last time you went in this way, I didn't think it was executed right. So, now that you're so loved and respected as a bad guy, should you go a slightly different direction, it'll be interesting to see where am your character really, goes. Am I really a bad guy or am I a guy that's being tough and um, not just following the standard that everybody else follows? Well, you you tried to cheat on Sunday or were you just trying to trick the, I mean, you went and got chairs. Hey, man. You got to do what you got to do. And um, I'm going to keep doing what I have to do to win because I want to win. I honestly want to win. Success brings in money. Success brings in fans. And your success concretes your legacy. And my, my legacy is important to me. I want my son to be able to, and, and my daughter, to have something tangible when I'm dead. I don't think about just the now. And I, I, success does that. I, you got to win. To celebrate, you got to win. So well, last thing I'm going to ask, before these three years are done, who's one person you want to have a real great program with? Uh, take her. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't love? Did you not love what you guys did? You guys did one mania together. We did one. And I wasn't the guy that I am now then. And I think I'm I'm think I'm doing another shot. And you and Taker are pretty close, right? We we know each other. <laughs> we know each other a lot better than a lot of other people. Than other I people work with. Right. Well you guys are both Texas guys. Both old school. Old school. I think it's by the way really interesting that you said Rock and Taker next to each other because Rocky for his importance for what he's outside the business, Taker's the imp- epitome of important inside the business. In the business. Like, Taker's not a huge star outside the business. I mean, people know the name, but it's certainly nothing like Rocky. But inside the business, Taker's everything. And Taker respects what you do for the business. And he would not put himself above somebody 
that's bringing money into this business and attention into this business that at the level of what Rock is doing. When Rock and Hogan faced each other, amazing. They had a moment that was a top one, top two moment. But still, you know, it's that that number one is concrete. Everything else is everybody else is second place. The world's strongest man, Mark Henry. Thank you.